Hey, I'm Kale, and today we're covering Rubber Soul by the Beatles. Rubber Soul is the Beatles' sixth studio album and is widely considered a turning point in the Beatles' career, uh, where they sort of turn from a more pop-focused spectrum to a psych rock, folk rock spectrum. It was released December 3rd, 1965, with paired with the double A-side non-album single, Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out. And it was released only three months after their previous album, Help. Personnel, as usual, is John Lennon on rhythm guitar, vocals, and organ. Paul McCartney on vocals, bass, acoustic, and lead guitar. George Harrison on lead guitar, uh, vocals, and sitar and Ringo Starr on vocals, drums, and various percussion instruments. And like I said earlier, this album is far different from literally every other earlier Beatles, Beatles album. One side, it being heavily inspired by folk rock, like Bob Dylan and the Birds. And at the same time, George Harrison became increasingly more interested in Eastern and Indian music, which he learned from David Crosby, also of the Birds. With all of these new upcoming genres mashed into one, this album became a key piece in the creation of psych rock and prog rock. With the vague intro of the album out of the way, let's get into the recording. <laughs> album took place um, on sessions from October 12th to November 15th of 1965. It was really the first Beatles album recorded without prior any prior commitments getting in the way of the recording sessions. There's no tours, there were no films, there were no, you know, radio interviews or anything. They just kind of got this month to themselves and recorded. Which at least I think is one of the main reasons why they stopped touring after Revolver came out, because they had... <laughs> You know, seeing how nice it was to record Rubber Soul without any trouble or hassle, so they just decided to stop touring altogether. Some notable things during the recording is Paul McCartney switched from his usual Hofner violin bass to a Rickenbacker bass, which he would use for basically the rest of his career, except for the uh, Let It Be sessions, where he just used his Hofner. Other instrument switches, George Harrison started learning the sitar, which was used on the second track, Norwegian Wood, and used heavily throughout their next three albums. During the sessions, EMI Studios got their hands on a harmonium, which John Lennon played on the single We Can Work It Out, which was recorded during the Rubber Soul sessions. This is also probably one of the last Beatles albums where in which the recording sessions, they weren't fighting 24 seven, which I mean, I don't even have to explain I just don't think the Beatles liked each other that very much. No, they did. They just didn't. The notable thing that happened during the recording sessions is that they got their MBE, some British thing. I guess it's like a night, but not. British people are crazy, man. Rubber Soul was also the first Beatles album where the Beatles themselves were calling the shots and not just George Martin and the other producers. They were deciding how they wanted their songs arranged and how they wanted a song to sound. With that, let's get into our favorite part, the track-by-track track breakdown. Number one is Drive My Car. It is definitely a song on this album. Oh no, it's never really been one of my favorites, but it is one of the first Beatles tracks where the bass is just up front like it's a lead guitar. It was an increasingly more popular theme throughout the Beatles' career. The song's basically about some guy's girlfriend who wants to be famous and that he can be your chauffeur. And that's it. Number two, Norwegian Wood. Norwegian Wood is one of the best, if not the best, if not one of the best, if not the best songs on this album. It is the first demonstration of sitar on a Beatles track. And boy, is it prominent. <laughs> They didn't even decide to be subtle with it. It's just, it was the lead focus of the whole song. Do any test runs with the sitar in the background? No, they just went all out, just right in front. And it worked. It worked great. However, besides the fact that it has the sitar on it, there's not much else to talk about. I was going to mention that it sounds like a Birds or Bob Dylan track, but then I realized every song in this album sounds like a Birds or a Bob Dylan track. But I could talk about the lyrics. Now this song, this song's wild. It's basically about 
John Lennon has some affair with this girl and she makes him sleep in the bathtub. So then when he wakes up and, she's, and he sees he, she's not there, he burns down her house. <laughs> Little bit of an overreaction, I'd say, but that's John Lennon for you, I guess. John, yes, it is good. It is quite good. For the arson part, that's not that, that's not as good. Number three is You Won't See Me. You Won't See Me is actually my favorite track on the whole album, one of them. So totally random, but their roadie Mal Evans actually plays uh, Hammond organ on it, so that's cool. The song is three minutes and 22 seconds long, and actually, up until that point, it was actually the longest Beatles song that they had recorded. And that's actually quite an interesting thing to note, as you notice in the current years, pop music getting shorter and shorter, like, say, 10 years ago, a song would be three and a half minutes, and now the radio hits are like two and a half minutes long. It kind of went up and down. Through, throughout the 50s and until the mid-60s, a lot of songs were two to three minutes long, and then you had songs with, like, nine, then you had psych rock and, like, R&B hit the scene, like, massively, and the songs are, like, four to eight minutes long. And then you get into the, like, tw 2000s and songs start to shorten again. So it's just kind of like a cycle where it gets short and then it gets long and then it gets short. And I don't know, we'll have to see if it gets long again. I must say up until that point though, because majority songs after Rubber Soul are over three and a half minutes long. Most Paul McCartney Beatles songs from 1965, it's about his failing relationship with Jane Asher. I don't really care, they broke up 60 years ago. <laughs> Number four is Nowhere Man. Nowhere Man is written entirely by John Lennon and it really evokes this Dylan-esque style of songwriting. I can't explain it, but the like, the singularity of one person, the center person, the center mysterious person really makes it seem like a Dylan song. Nowhere Man is one of many John Lennon self-deprecation songs written from 1964 to 1965. In that list, is I'm a loser, I don't want to spoil the party, help, nowhere, man. John Lennon was very depressed from 1964 to 1965 with, you know, everything that has already happened in his life from when he was a child, along with the constant touring, which was taking a toll on literally everyone's mental health then, and the, like, constant drinking and drug abuse that was happening then. So he wrote all these, like, self-deprecating songs to, I don't know, make himself feel better or something and on a less depressing note this was one of the only songs from like rubber soul to revolver that they played live they barely played anything after help live for the next six months after rubber soul was released because they only toured for another six months after they only toured until august of 1966 uh to support revolver but they didn't play any revolver songs or really any rubber soul songs they played they played Nowhere Man and I believe If I Needed Someone and Paperback Writer and that's it. Next we have Think For Yourself. Think For Yourself is the first Harrison song on this album and it really reminds me of like later Beatles stuff. It really sounds like something that they would do just a short two and a half years later on the White Album. It is also one of my favorite songs on the album, as are a lot of them. I think the fuzz bass really makes it sound like 1968 Beatles opposed to 1965 Beatles. We have a different sound for each year that they were making music. Next is The Word. The Word is like the Beatles' first anthem, or as I like to call them, the Peace PSA. Think like all you need is love. It's really just this song centered around one central narrative that is love. It was really, this song at least, was really the kickstart of the counterculture love anthems of the mid to late 60s. Next is Michelle. Now Michelle seems like it's this poignant French ballad, but it's really not. It's more of like a parody of Beatles songs. It's just a parody of themselves. Speaking broken French and just cult and just straight up saying that the words in the song fit together well. Really one of two Beatles comedy songs along with 
you know my name, look up the number, but we don't talk about that guy. Opening up side two, we have What Goes On. What Goes On was originally written by John Lennon in the early 60s. Uh, it was recorded once in 1963, but it, along with One After 909 actually, but ultimately just kind of got scrapped. But in the race of the last week of recording to make sure that this album was in fact a pre-Christmas release, they were just scrambling to get another track and they pulled out, you know, what goes on and they made Ringo sing it. It's kind of a messy track. You know, the guitar sounds like you handed the guitar to like an 80 year old with arthritis that used to play when he was like 20, which kind of makes the song charming, honestly. You know, Ringo sings it, there's like, really bad guitar it's one it's just one you know beat the whole way through and the bass is actually surprisingly complex for the song which is weird but it's a charming little song it's not great but it's not bad next is girl <laughs> i'm really funny girl is a really interesting song in the way that okay just just like some backstory, well technically front story because it takes place after this. In mid-1966, John Lennon's quote was taken out of context where he said something about them being more popular at the time than Jesus Christ. Now, Girl is a song about John Lennon, like sort of despise of normal Christian morals and like normal gender roles. Which is interesting because once John Lennon said the whole like vague thing about them being very popular, then they start burning their albums. But they didn't even seem to notice anything on, on Girl because they don't listen to the lyrics. That's a recurring theme with people. People with Beatles lyrics. Except I am the walrus and octopus's garden and yellow submarine. Okay, okay, maybe that wasn't the greatest point, but you know. The song is structured like an old Greek folk song. In fact, the acoustic guitar has a capo on like a very low fret, so it makes it sound sort of like a bazooki a little bit, which is a traditional Greek instrument. Next is an even messier song than what goes on. I'm looking through you. It's a good song, don't get me wrong, but it just seems like the instrumentation was done by a bunch of eight-year-olds with ADHD. It's just like you're in the middle of a verse and all of a sudden it changes the tempo and like a guitar just makes a random sound that's not really rhythmic in any way. It's not, it doesn't help the song. It just, just happens. Someone drops a tambourine halfway through and they just decide to not add it back in. So it's a song. Next is In My Life, arguably the most famous song on this album. It's one of John Lennon's best ballads, if not just best song writing ever. It's the it's his best songwriting ever. It's pretty much considered to be John Len John Lennon's first great work. You know, on par with like Strawberry Fields and Imagine. And fun fact, the harpsichord solo is not a harpsichord solo. It was a it was originally a normal piano solo that George Martin did because he was asked to do a piano solo because none of the Beatles really felt like it. So he did a piano solo and then he listened back to it and he realized it was a completely different speed. So he just sped it up and it made it sound like a harpsichord, but it fit in the song. This is Wait. In my opinion, it's the most forgettable song on the album, but that's me. It's also one of the more country-ish songs on the album, sort of like Beatles for Sale-esque, where it was all just sort of Johnny Cash. <laughs> That's all I have to say about it. Look, it's another cat. Hello. If I needed someone. Now, I know I've been saying that all of the songs on this album basically sound like the birds. This song is literally just a bird song. <laughs> this literally sounds like it was written for the bird. Like I can just hear Roger McQuinn and David Crosby on it. <laughs> So the second Harrison song on this album. And finally, Run For Your Life. Run For Your Life is an interesting song, shall we say. It's very country-esque, it's very Hank Williams-esque. Instrumentally, it's not that special, you know? It's kind of like what goes on where it's sort of just fiddly. Now it's the lyrics that are really weird. Now John Lennon based the lyrics off of the opening line from Elvis Presley's 
debut single, Let's Play House. Uh, the line, <laughs> bear with me here, is I'd rather see you dead little girl than to be with another man. Mm. That does not seem right. It's a creepy song. The song is basically just this guy telling his girlfriend that if she cheats on him, he's gonna kill her. So that's fantastic. Great way to close this album. Yeah, that's Rubber Soul. Now, my thoughts. Rubber Soul is a great Beatles album. Now, like I've said before, every Beatles album is a great Beatles album. So what does that mean for this Beatles album? I actually do like some of the Beatles' earlier stuff over this album. Like, this album was really them finding themselves with, you know, their career in their latter period, which was mostly psych rock. Like, there were elements of psychedelia in this album, but they really found themselves in their next album, Revolver, which I'll cover sometime, which I consider one of the first psych rock albums out there. One of the first. I'm not forgetting Pet Sounds. Don't worry. Don't come at me, Pet Sound stands. But I even prefer Help over Rubber Soul, but I think the impact and, like, how influential one album is goes to Rubber Soul, for sure. But yeah, great Beatles album. Uh, anyway, bye, bozos.